So I was actually going to do a video commenting on the recent news concerning the mother, um, is it in Detroit? I'm not really sure the location. I just know it's all over the news right now because I had to share it to my wife. It was just so provoking. Uh, the mother who left her child at home for 10 days while she vacationed uh, with, I guess, two boyfriends. Uh, um, yeah, it was so, so graphic. Uh, and I guess I should probably forewarn the same way a lot of these news stations did. And I'll post a link to the actual news article um, in the description if y'all are uh, interested in looking it up. Um, but this mother left her child, an infant, home for 10 days, um, and the child starved to death, literally um, covered in their own excrement. Um, <clears throat> and of course, in good fashion, the American legal system is very lackluster when it comes to justice. Um, I think part of the reason why I write on it and talk about it so much is not just because I feel like in Christianity, God is so lackluster when it comes to justice, uh, but it seems like our own legal system here in the West, even though it prides itself on being just, is anything but just. <clears throat> but in this case, um, while I have qualms about the sentencing, they still gave her life in prison, and I was quite surprised to see a judge uh, take charge and actually take, it seemed like, some type of moral initiative. Uh, it seemed like the entire court including the police officers who, um, I guess, had to go and get the child, or the first responders that had to rescue the child. or They obviously didn't rescue them, but the first responders who responded to the mother who called um, 911 also testified against her. Um, it kind of shows you, like, <clears throat> the collective, the collective moral mentality of a people, even though we might disagree about the finer details of things. And sometimes those finer details flesh out into what seemed to be very grave details. In cases like this, everyone's united, right? Uh, that was what this video was actually going to be about, was me talking about evil, God's relationship to evil, um, the fact that evil is very prevalent and um, innate, uh, it seems like, or pervasive, sorry, in our own experience of reality, and that, as I've mentioned before, this idea of privation of evil, that Christianity and Platonism so propound seems to be on the face of it false. Evil seems to be very, very pervasive in our life, and it seems to be far more tangibly apparent in our lives, um, and of course the experiences we have, than good. Um, but that is not going to be the focus of this video. Instead, William Lane Craig had an interview with Alex O'Connor recently. And boy, is it spicy. Now, if you're watching this and you're like, who the heck is William Lane Craig? I'm going to post a link to that YouTube channel down below in the description as well. You need to watch that. William Lane Craig is near and dear to my heart. Whenever I used to teach Christian apologetics all those many years ago, when I was employed as a minister, um, William Lane Craig was the guy to go to. Initially, that's the guy I read. Uh, that's the guy I studied. I looked at his academic stuff. I looked at his personal stuff. I looked at his lay stuff. Um, <clears throat> I watched all of his videos and stuff. I followed his entire career there for a bit. Uh, and I sort of modeled a lot of the stuff he was doing. Um, didn't have the same views he did. Obviously, I was reformed. But I still appreciated his take on a number of things. And I remember reading, uh, I've talked about this topic before um, that we're about to get in, into, uh, Paul Copen's book, Is a God a Moral Monster? And the fact that William Lane Craig seemed to be such a fan of it because he referenced it, I think, in his debate with... Well, no, it wasn't with him. I was going to say Christopher Hitchens, but it wasn't with Christopher Hitchens. I can't think of the guy's name. Uh, the younger guy who's a part of that whole atheism movement. It'll come to me eventually. He wrote The um, Moral Landscape. I know the name of his book, but I can't think of his name. How terrible is that? Anyways, um... William Lane Craig flexed that book pretty hard during that debate, and it's in that book that we see probably the first real experience, at least on the popular level, of this argument concerning how do we morally categorize or make sense of God's command to the Israelites to go slaughter the Canaanites. Um, <clears throat> now, obviously, if you're a Christian, or maybe even if you're not a Christian, if you've read the Old Testament, you know... It's full of all kinds of any number of occasions where God's killing people. I think that we just oftentimes gloss over the fact that embedded within those people are not just innocent and good people, but we kind of just throw them off to the wolves because we just, I guess because of the Bible's own stance on people's natures, we just don't think any people are good. 
we also don't care about animals here in the West. <laughs> Sorry, all you philosophers who talk about animal rights all the time. Uh, pretty much every single lay person who probably even halfway identifies with Christianity or some kind of nominal form of Christianity only cares about their golden retriever. And so they don't care about all the, the animals that got slaughtered because they're just like, we'll eat them anyways. Um, so the only place one can go in these conversations, and Alex O'Connor goes there quite rightfully, is the children. The Bible is very clear. And this is something, again, I've talked about any number of times. Uh, I feel like it's almost getting redundant. But just to see William Lane Craig defend it so fervently, I had to comment. So, from the outset, I like William Lane Craig. I've always liked William Lane Craig. I'm not a Christian, and I still like William Lane Craig. I think he's cool. I think if we hung out, I think he'd be a really swell guy. He seems very sweet, very kind. His view on this is borderline insane, right? I know he's got philosophers who back him up and say, oh, he's super uber rational. And yeah, his perspective could be rational. That doesn't mean that it's good, right? Uh, and Alex O'Connor harbors on this quite a bit, um, this whole idea of moral intuition. Does this sound familiar? Alex O'Connor is smarter than I am. I'm not saying he's borrowing from me. But I am saying we're probably participating in something very similar, and Alex O'Connor is not a moral realist. I think he's a, an emotivist. He doesn't even think morality has like some objective, binding, factual matter to it. Whereas I do. I actually do. I tend to find myself far more inclined towards the natural law tradition, but with a heavy emphasis on intuition, intuitionism. Um, uh, so I wanted to comment a little bit, talk about a little bit what's going on, and kind of flesh this out in light of the fact that well, in the news, we just had a woman leave her infinite home to starve to death, um, basically drowning in their own excrement. So let's talk first about what I like in this debate. What I like in this debate is that William Lane Craig essentially verifies everything I've been talking about for like, well, pretty much since I brought this YouTube channel back. I think that it was quite a shock for a lot of people to hear that I was leaving Christianity in total, uh, or the fact that I converted to another faith altogether. Um, but the reasons why I left Christianity, I think, were probably the most potent, right? Um, my whole entire purpose for leaving Christianity is that I found that God was a disappointment. My most active video, with at least 18,000 views now, is literally titled the same, The God of Disappointment. I left Christianity because I thought Yahweh was not just at all. And I care a lot about justice. And not just like some wimpy, reformative justice. I mean like actual, punitive, retributive justice. I've talked a lot about revenge. <laughs> I think that those things are plausibly good. Uh, I, I think I've made some really good arguments to, to build a case that justice in total, revenge partially, can be or are virtuous and good. And that forgiveness is not, right? So here I am saying that I don't think Yahweh's just. I think he's cruel. I think he's evil. Um, sure, he might express mercy, but he has a, a real vendetta, it seems, against innocent, innocent people. Uh, he is the embodiment of divine utilitarianism, uh, which I find to be, again, holistically evil. Um, and I think the reason I really liked this conversation, I don't know if I said debate before, it's not a debate, it's more of a conversation. Alex O'Connor, by the way, excellent. He used to be called Cosmic Skeptic. I've followed him for a long time. Very rational guy. Uh, if we had to rate him, I would say he's definitely like the embodiment of morally gray uh, or um, lawfully neutral. <laughs> he is so good at playing the agnostic. And I think it's just because he really is an agnostic on a number of issues, and I respect him for that. Um, much smarter guy than me. Um, with a much better education, too. Um, so I did like this conversation for the fact that William Lane Craig really fleshed out a lot of the things that I've been talking about for a long time and consistently followed them to their end. Um, something I'll probably talk about here later, uh, but William Lane Craig is positively maniacal in this conversation. He is the sweet old man that we've all wanted as our grandfather. You imagine his grandkids going to his home, and they, him and his wife probably bake them a pie. He is all-American, very kind. Um, it seems like he would never harm a soul. And then goes on laughing, essentially, and almost seems not with a high sense of uh, uh, naivete to basically say that not only 
was the slaughter of the Canaanites morally justified? But on his moral theory, no one was really harmed in the scenario. The children, the animals, the adults, not even the Israelite soldiers who had to experience the turmoil of slaughtering innocents, which we have definitely found out in the modern era they have no problem doing. Ooh, political. But I'm sure, sure plenty of people are going to love that. Um, <clears throat> but William Lane Craig essentially says that on his own moral theory, which is the divine command theory, which he calls de divine command morality, um, essentially everything is rooted back to the goodness that is embedded in God's nature. And since he roots goodness in God's nature, and this, this was a bit of the surprising part, divine command theorists do tend to sort of disagree on certain issues. Certainly when I argued for divine command theory in college, I was not willing to bite the bullet and say that God could command things that seem intuitively morally debauched, right? God couldn't command you to, for example, if monogamous marriage is good, God wouldn't command you to have frivolous premarital sex. That's one example. Um, one I've used in my own debates, um, person, like actual, actual debates on YouTube and in person and stuff like that, um, I, mean, I obviously thought that uh, God would never command you, because obviously you're supposed to have children and raise children and love your children. Um, he would never command you to consume your children. William Lane Craig's perspective here now makes me question whether or not he would agree with me. Uh, it seems like he's taken, and I could be speaking incorrectly here, but at least in college I was exposed to um, this sort of absolutist perspective of divine command theory where God could command anything, even if it seemed illogical. And it would then therefore be true because God commanded it, and evidently this is a subset coming out of Islam, which I guess would would kind of make sense given some of the crazy stuff that kind of comes out of Islam. But <clears throat> William Lane Craig is willing to comply and say that God could give these sort of normative moral standards to humans, but then could, and for any intensive purpose, since he is the embodiment or standard of good, sort of supersede those or override those and then offer new commands that are temporal um, that may completely conflict with the commands that he gave before as in this case where murdering is normatively wrong, but in the case where God commanded the Israelites to slaughter the Canaanites, he's like, go ham on those kids. Um, that sounds insane to me. Alex O'Connor pretty much admits as much as well, even though he's an a ethical emotivist. Um, he talks a lot about how this flies in the face of our natural intuition. And yeah, uh, I think it flies in the face of our natural intuition, and I think it flies in the face of our natural intuition because at least if the good is grounded in something akin to our nature, and talking about natural law here, and that et ethics is a very human thing, um, well, yeah, our moral intuition would probably work as a sort of uh, quasi-faulty barometer for determining some of the higher and lower aspects of morality, even to the untrained person, right? Obviously, ethics is something we can be trained in, we can hone and get better at. Different philosophers had different perspectives, like Aristotle thinking it was grounded in habit. You know, you could get better at being ethical by just fake it till you make it. Or maybe even the Stoics, where it was like a, a mind properly oriented towards what one's nature is, right? So you could live in accordance with it. Uh, so it was a, far more of a, a rational thing, um, a learned thing, if you will. Um, <clears throat> it seems like if our natural intuition has any merit at all, and certainly some Christians would just say, well, it doesn't, uh, which I think in and of itself seems counterintuitive, um, Craig's perspective sounds, as Alex suggested, kind of insane, right? Craig comes off like I said, almost maniacal. Um, in any other context, uh, not knowing Craig's character and him making this argument, he would almost sound like a villain. Uh, that's pretty much how it kind of came off. And typically you want to leave the villainy, uh, the villainous perspective to the Calvinists. They, they do that enough for the Christians. They, you don't really need anybody else doing it. Trust me, if it's something bad coming out of Christianity, you can leave it to the fundamentalist or the Calvinist. They will... So I appreciated the fact that Craig went to great lengths to really, and I don't mean this facetiously, I mean I really do feel like he proved my point. I think for Christians who are the uber logicians, and what I mean is those people who basically live in the ivory tower of their own minds, um, in my own time working in ministry, um, some of the guys that I would work with, you know, they sort of made fun of them. They, they, they would be like these young guys, never attended church in their life. Uh, they went to seminary, got their master's degree at seminary are never going to get a ministerial job because no church even knows who they are. It's all about networking and knowing people. 
And so they just have a bunch of heady knowledge about Christianity, and they are like philosophers. They've had modern philosophers, not ancient philosophers. Um, they live in sort of an ivory tower. Uh, Socrates has no place, right? And so they, they, they have no real-world experiences, and so when they come up against stuff like this, they just full sail adopt it. They're like, well, this is rational. I buy into it because I've already got these preconceived notions of what is true and real and good. And so this fits, and this kind of squares away some of the stuff I had questions about. And it's a really good answer I could just give to someone who asks about it. I imagine for those persons, this is savvy. Uh, and I, I appreciate that Craig, again, like I said, proved my point. But I think for any normal person who's experienced suffering, experienced real evil in life, anyone who's lived a normal life, anyone who's worked retail, <laughs> anyone who's literally been a normal Joe their whole life, which is what I consider myself to be. I've never been wealthy. I've never had some luxurious job. Um, I've never been famous or anything like that. Um, I've just lived a normal, regular life. And so sometimes what I try to do is even though I love a lot of this heady, weird philosophy stuff with all these crazy, weird terms, I also realize that philosophy has no practical use if we don't bring it down to reality. And that's what I try to do. I oftentimes try to apply philosophy in real-world situations and see what sticks. Right? This is why I oftentimes recommend if you're you know, interested in a religion, and that religion has a founder or persons it prioritizes as special, maybe look at how they lived their lives. See how consistent and good they were. And then make a judgment, okay? Um, the religion, by all means, could be completely rational. Still not good or desirable. I think for people like that who look at Craig's answer, certainly there'll be Christians who'll say, oh, no, I don't really buy into that. It's just not really my perspective. Maybe we could just say this is not historical or something like that, and they could just move on so that they can stay comfortably within Christianity without, you know, kicking the goads or trying to, you know, tip the boat. Uh, but I think for a lot of rational people, good people, who maybe identify with Christianity will see that video and think, are we the baddies? Am I on the wrong side of this? Let me answer that for you. As someone used to be on the other side, yes, you are. The God you worship is basically the moral equivalent of a demon. Uh, he is evil. And if you just step back for maybe two steps and look at this thing from like a 30,000 foot view, the God of the Bible is probably the most atrocious thing you're ever going to lay eyes upon. So atrocious that he continues to try to invert the moral landscape so that he looks good. And it ain't working because we were born with a natural moral intuition. And that intuition is not perfect, but it's quite good. Like I said, even if you're untrained in ethics, you can make ethical decisions generally. If you're really trained in ethics, then you can make really precise ethical judgments. But we're all expected to make ethical judgments. That's our nature as a human. Thank you, Musonius Rufus. Anyways, <clears throat> uh, I think that this will be helpful in further conversations. It'll definitely be a video to share um, for people who are more normal <laughs> and they see this and they're like, oh my God, I, I have kids. I have a wife. Like they can apply the practicalities of how this will have implications for anyone, anyone, anyone who takes this view, I think of Craig's in isolation and then applies it to the real world would have to immediately abandon it because they could, of course could be on the receiving end of Craig's divine command morality. <laughs> Just tomorrow, God could be the sole arbiter and the commands that end your life and your own families. Um, so certainly something to be abandoned. I think this is probably the ugliest view I've ever seen. Um, but also the comment section. You have to read it. It is absolutely insane, especially for people who live in the Middle East and they talk about how Islam uh, ha has treated them, especially Islamic extremists, and how they've used very similar arguments to go in and kill children and women uh, simply because they're like, look, and Craig says this, by the way, Craig says this. <clears throat> the justification is, if they're evil, well, they deserve it. And if they're innocent, well, they'll just go to heaven and they'll go to a better life. That is insanity. Absolute insanity and evil. Completely wicked and evil. But Craig defends it. He says that actually it could be a good uh, that God commands this, especially for the children, because, of course, the children who die will just go straight to heaven. Cannot make this up. Can't, cannot make this up. So where does the ugly come in in all of this? Well, I think it's all pretty ugly, honestly. Um, I mean, I could point out some bad points here, like, but I think Alex O'Connor does it better. If you really want to swim through that debate, I highly encourage you to scope it out. I really just wanted to tune in and basically express how I felt about it. Um, I have talked about the divine command theory of ethics way too much, and so I don't plan on going into the woods again talking about this. Um, but what I can say, at least from the surface, right, what I don't like about it, the general theory at, at large, right, I think it's just 
patently wrong. Um, I think Craig's perspective will immediately fall apart. And this is this is just me speaking as just another rational person to anybody else out there who sees this and thinks, you know what, maybe Christianity is not for me, right? Like I've experienced this, I've been having questions, you know, this is just not it for me. It's not that it's not super rational, maybe it is rational, but my value set is not represented by this religion. I think you're in a good place because I found myself in a very similar predicament. And what I would say is that I do not. I am a moral realist, and I do think that uh, our moral intuition really does matter. And I, like I said, even if you're an untrained ethical, untrained in ethics, but yet you are a human, you can still make moral decisions, at least some, right? And your moral intuition works as a constantly reforming barometer for what is hot and cold, good and bad, right? And so to fly in the face of that moral intuition uh, seems positively counterintuitive. And I think that that's there for, I think that's there by design, right? I have a specific worldview as well. Uh, and I think that if you were to hold Craig's worldview up in isolation, rational, to other worldviews, it's going to fall far flat. It's going to look inferior. I found myself converting to Zoroastrianism later in life. And this is because what I discovered was that there were far better perspectives of God, far better theologies, and of course, far better perspectives on justice um, and other worldviews. And I'm not saying Zoroastrianism is the end-all, be-all, like the best all pers perspective. Obviously, I I'm open for disagreement. I'm open for people to disagree with me. I'm only trying to press you towards maybe a small hint of interest. Scope it out, right? I've referenced before. I won't go into great detail, like you know, all resources or whatever. But I did find that within Zoroastrianism, you get a far more wholesome perspective of God. And this is just my little sales pitch. But um, if this really does bug you, if this is something you do find really repulsive and ugly, I can guarantee you that Zoroastrianism does not have something like this. Instead, Zoroastrianism is all about familial values, uh, taking care of the innocent, the poor, women, children. And God in Zoroastrianism would never command the slaughter of children. It just would not happen. Actually, profoundly, there's a lot of animal um, imagery in the Gathas, and so probably a really good emphasis. Actually, there is in Zoroastrianism a really good emphasis on how to take care of animals. Zarathustra himself, the great philosopher po prophet, uh, really did judge people by how well they herded their animals. Uh, and so very, very contra <laughs> whatever's happening in the Old Testament of the Bible. If you have questions about that, please ask in the comments. I'd love to discuss it. But how does this how does this play into our real world example? As I kind of draw this on home, well, recall at the beginning of this video, I said I initially wanted to talk about the woman in I'm going to say Detroit. I don't know if it's Detroit, but if you look it up, it's the woman who left her infinite home recently. She just got sentenced to life in prison for leaving her infinite home for ten days while she went on vacation with uh, allegedly two boyfriends. <laughs> it, it just gets worse as you read more into it, but. She's basically going and living her um, hedonist dreams, and her child's at home crying and dying and starving to death. Um, during that court battle, her parents actually went before the judge and asked the judge to be merciful to her because she has anxiety and um, so all, all kinds of mental uh, problems. Um, yeah, no sale. Right, that judge was just like, I don't give a damn. <laughs> and good for him, by the way. I'm tired of people leaning back on all these quasi-pseudo-mental problems so that they can get out of justice's way, as if that even matters. Um, but in her little speech that she gave at the end, it was translated because she spoke only in Spanish, but she said something to the effect of um, she missed her child, and she hoped to see her child again, um, presumably with God. Um or in heaven, I can't remember how she phrased it. And all I could think to myself was, only within Christianity would that be possible. Because Christianity so prioritizes the forgiveness of the wicked over the justice due to the innocent and the ones harmed. That is ugly. But even then, on Craig's view, this child received a great good. This child received a great good because, yeah, it may have been robbed of... The temporal pleasures of a short life of maybe 90 to 100 years. Yes, this child basically was um, not given the life that we were all given, taken too young. Mm. But it's going to enjoy the bliss of heaven from the same God that 
determine the world of which it would exist in and which these things would actually happen to it. Um, this is... God is mysterious, and he works in mysterious ways. And uh, who are we to go against his decrees? If that type of mentality, in all seriousness, uh, bugs you, and you think that is ugly, um, come on over. <clears throat> Check out my channel. I, I think you'll find that I have something far better to offer you. Uh, not just me, by the way. Um, an entire community, right? Um, there's, there's loads of us that believe this way. Um, yeah. I look forward to hearing the comments on this. I just had to comment on it while it was fresh. Um, so many things going on with it, and I'm sure after I make this video, I'm gonna think of a billion other things I should have said, or a billion other things that I wanna talk about. Maybe I'll come back and touch on it again. Um, but yeah.